from Case at 12. The night beat starts right now. She was tased multiple times in a 34 minute period. The defenders looking into the case of an area officer accused of using a stun gun on his own girlfriend more than once. But first, we got breaking news from the city's east side tonight. Police working a shooting in the 1800 block of Rogers Avenue. That is located in the Government Hill neighborhood near I-35 in New Braunfels. Officers are on scene and seem to have blocked a part of the roadway there. We do have a crew on scene and we will bring you the latest as it becomes available. Well, change in testing after an abuse of the system and one business shut down over the weekend after operating illegally. It all comes as we continue to see fewer and fewer available and staffed beds at area hospitals. Tonight, 1,168 people are in the hospital in Bear County, 382 people in intensive care. There are also 213 people on ventilators helping them breathe. Right now, we are at just 12% capacity. Well, it is very fragile at a, at a 12% capacity rate. It takes at least 5% capacity to move people in and out. So we're tight. We're holding people in the emergency rooms. All of our systems are. And if you have a heart attack or you're coming in a car wreck or something, we want to make sure we have the capacity to manage you as well. Tonight, Bear County has a total of 15,102 COVID-19 cases after more than 300 cases were confirmed. The death toll has increased by two for a total of 132. The number of recoveries has increased to more than 5,800, but there are still 9,100 people fighting the illness. Even as hundreds of medical staff and therapists from the military and state begin to arrive to back up our local hospitals, we teeter on the verge of running out of doctors, nurses and beds. As the community was asked to stay inside for the 4th of July holiday, a bar was shut down. As the night team's Patty Santos reports, there is also a change in testing. Testing sites managed by the city are now only seeing people with symptoms, a change Metro Health and Mayor says was necessary to ensure those without insurance get priority. There are many people in this community, though, who are only able to access those free testing sites because they don't have an insurance. So if you don't have to go to a free testing site, leave it for somebody who needs that free test. In the past, people with insurance were using the free testing sites despite their ability to get tested by private providers. Others, the city say we're abusing the free system. Some people were abusing it by getting several different tests that exactly. again bogged up the line. And, and Although only 350 new cases were reported on Monday, a drastic drop from recent days. The city says it will be weeks before the plateau is seen. We are seeing a decline. It remains to be seen if this decline is going to be sustained. But until that happens, uh, it's difficult to say if we've reached a plateau. Hundreds of nurses and therapists are arriving and will be in the coming weeks from the state and military to back up local ICUs. Without that, we'd be in a much more dire situation than we are. So adding staff from the state and feds has helped significantly. Efforts to crack down on violations have also ramped up. This weekend, the city reports 48 calls were received regarding public health enforcement violations. Drink Texas Bar in downtown was shut down for operating illegally. The owner says he's concerned about the increase in COVID cases, but is fighting for a fair application of the city county ordinance in court. If it's proven and, and, and justified that, that it's not safe to be in a bar, then, then no bar should be open, a restaurant bar or a regular bar. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. Now the bar owner tells us he was given a citation by SAPD. He tells us he expects to find out if the temporary restraining order he filed will be granted in court this week. When it comes to testing, the city announced two walk-up testing sites will be open seven days a week through the end of July. They're at Kazen Middle School on Gillette Boulevard and Cuellar Community Center on San Fernando. The sites will be open from 10 in the morning until 2 p.m. There's a limit of 300 tests per day. A reminder, if you do have insurance, you're encouraged to get a test through your health care provider. Another outbreak of COVID-19 at a nursing facility, this case linked to Prairie Meadows Rehabilitation and Healthcare Center in Floresville. A spokesperson for the facility says out of the 48 residents, 26 are confirmed to have the virus. We're told all the residents and staff were tested on June 3rd and everyone tested negative at that time. Another round of testing uncovered the current results. 
Floresville's mayor says two staff at the facility also tested positive. In a statement from the facility spokesperson, they said in part, quote, we have been unable to identify how this highly contagious virus entered the facility, but in general, Texas is experiencing record highs in the number of daily new cases and hospitalizations. Many suspect this is due to the reopening effort that began in early June. It is probably a major factor in what is happening now, end quote. This crisis has a lot of small businesses looking for help. Nearly 3,000 local businesses have requested help, including Bill Miller Barbecue and the law offices of Thomas J. Henry. They requested between five and $10 million in loans through the Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP. The U.S. Small Business Administration released that data today. Here's a list of a few more entities that requested funding help. They include the Archdiocese of San Antonio, Morgan's Wonderland, and the San Antonio Food Bank. The loans are made by lending institutions, which are then guaranteed by the Small Business Administration. Those loans must be used for payroll costs, interest on mortgages, rent, and utilities to be eligible for full loan forgiveness. 400 volunteers a week. That's how much it takes for the San Antonio Food Bank to continue supporting food distribution events amid the pandemic. And it's a need which is currently not being met. Officials with the Food Bank warn they may have to cut back or cancel some of their events because of the lack of volunteers. It's why they're now putting out the call. We're panicked. If we don't get more volunteers, that impedes our ability to make sure that no family goes hungry. We want families to know we're going to be there, but to be a little more patient if we don't see the volunteer numbers that we're used to seeing at our distributions. Food bank volunteers help distribute food directly to the community while following safety guidelines. Each volunteer must wear a mask and be at least 18 years old. The food bank will provide gloves and a temperature check before each shift. For those interested, you can register to volunteer online. We've provided a link at ksat.com. New details coming out of Fort Hood tonight. Military officials confirming the remains found along the Leon River are in fact that of Army Specialist Vanessa Guillen. Tonight, we are also hearing for the first time about an open investigation into sexual harassment that Guillen may have faced before her death. The night team's Jaffney Gray with how her military family is mourning her loss. The Armed Forces Forensic Examiner has determined through DNA analysis that the remains found near the Leon River are in fact those of Vanessa. Today, Fort Hood military officials made the unfortunate announcement regarding one of their very own. 20-year-old specialist Vanessa Guillen was found dead. This comes a day after the family made the announcement her remains had been identified. The soldier disappeared two months ago while on post. Thousands have searched dedicated to finding our soldier. An FBI investigation found that 20-year-old Army Specialist Aaron Robinson killed Guillen before hiding her body in a box. His estranged wife, 22-year-old Cecily Aguilar, allegedly helped Robinson dismember Guillen's body with an axe and after a failed attempt to burn her remains, buried them along the Leon River. Her military family says Guillen was a warrior. She embodied all the qualities that the American people expect and rely on our soldiers to be to defend our country. She was strong, courageous and caring. They say her death forms a devastating hole in their formation. The loss of a talented soldier, the loss of a loving family member, and the loss of a friend with a bright future ahead of her. Guillen's family's lawyer said her death was a result of sexual harassment. Initially, the military did not confirm that, but today was a different story. We will complete the ongoing investigation in sexual harassment and take actions against those findings. Guillen's death has caused an uproar of supporters to raise awareness about crimes against men and women who serve our country, an uproar that has not gone unnoticed. To the victims of sexual harassment and assault, we hear you, we believe you, and I encourage you to come forward. The Army will not stop its efforts to eradicate sexual harassment and sexual assault. Jaffney Gray, KSAT 12 News. Representative Will Hurd calling for an independent investigation into the sexual harassment charges tonight. Aaron Robinson, by the way, committed suicide as investigators tried to make contact with him after being suspected in Guillen's murder. Cecily Aguilar, who is in custody on a conspiracy to tamper with evidence charge, appeared in federal court today. She's facing up to 20 years in prison and a $250,000 fine. 
Her next hearing is set for July 14th. An active primary runoff election is expected. New early vote totals show more, show more than 26,000 ballots cast so far. That's nearly 12,000 Republicans and more than 14,000 Democrats. With a flow of early voters, Bear County Elections Administrator Jackie Callanan is making a prediction for what's expected on Election Day. Probably on Election Day, I would look to see maybe 18,000 people vote on Election Day. Uh, again, we just have to see. We have to see what the numbers are for the pandemic. Kalanen says so far the voting numbers are steady despite the pandemic. Voters are provided with gloves or pencils to have a contact free voting experience. The results for this runoff are also expected to arrive on time since the ballot is shorter and the software for the voting machines was repaired. Early voting, by the way, will continue through Friday, July 10th. Election Day is July 14th. You can find polling information and take a look at sample ballots right now on our website. Just go to ksat.com slash vote 2020. Earlier in the show, we told you about breaking news, a shooting on the city's east side. We also are continuing to following breaking news from the east side of police working a shooting in the 1800 block of Rogers Avenue. Yeah, this is in the Government Hill neighborhood, as we mentioned, near I-35 and New Braunfels. That roadway right now is blocked off a large police presence in that area. Yeah, we're also following breaking news from the city's west side. Police responding to a shooting near Fredericksburg and almost drive. It happened at a property in the 2100 block of Sacramento. You can see a car with its lights flashing and police there on scene. Police say the driver of that car was in the area to buy a gun from the suspect. Officers say the suspect shot the driver three times before taking off in a maroon truck. A busy night for San Antonio police. We'll continue to monitor both those situations. But still ahead on the night beat, with the number of staffed hospital beds getting smaller, a conversation on what lies ahead of us. Tonight's live KSAT Q&A with Eric Epley, the executive director of STRAC. And another change for an upcoming event, the impact the pandemic has blown to San Antonio's conventions. It's coming up. And plus, an area officer accused of using a taser on his live-in girlfriend multiple times. The Defender's investigation is up next. He was a high-ranking Seguin police officer accused of using his stun gun not once, but six times on his own girlfriend. Cuff my wrists, cuff my ankles, anything. I will do anything. Just take the taser out. Months after pleading no contest to a reduced charge, Eric Jimenez landed a job at the top of city government in a town just 60 miles away. As the night team's Dylan Collier reports, the people who hired Jimenez say they had no idea about his criminal history. A warning. What you're about to see could be disturbing to some of our viewers. When he drinks, he does things that he doesn't remember the next day. This Texas Rangers footage has never been seen publicly until now. It was recorded in late September 2016, just days after then Seguin Police Lieutenant Eric Jimenez informed his department he'd been forced to use his department-issued taser to stop his live-in girlfriend from hanging herself in a closet. The couple had been fighting at her house in Cibolo within days. I know to put my chin down um, to keep my air. The woman provided interviews to Seguin police. And he hit me in the head so many times over and over and over and over again. And also the Rangers revealing a possible pattern of abuse. I said, I'm done. I'm done. Please stop. I'm done. I'm done. Please stop. That culminated with the woman being tasered six times by Jimenez over a 34 minute period of time including on her stomach and chest, leaving blood evidence throughout much of her property. I'm not asking you to surrender. I think you just need to learn your lesson, and then you hit the taser again. While prosecutors at first contemplated charging Jimenez with a felony, he was booked that October for misdemeanor family violence causing injury. Her story doesn't add up. Her stories don't add up. And although Jimenez's attorney tried to claim his client didn't break the law or department rules, 
Jimenez resigned from the force. But I never felt like anybody would believe me. The victim, who participated in the early stages of the criminal investigation, stopped cooperating with prosecutors, which forced them to reduce the family violence charge to assault by contact. As part of the plea agreement, Jimenez had to surrender his peace officer's license. Six months later, in the fall of 2017, Jimenez was able to get the reduced charge dismissed. The decision was made to hire somebody to run the city. Reynaldo Anzaldúa is a former Poteet City Council member who was part of the elected body that chose in December 2017 to hire Jimenez as their city administrator. Anzaldúa now says he and other council members walked into that decision blindly. Our assumption at the council level was that the city had a background check uh, process in place because there's, there was a background check for other employees that were hired uh, for the water department, for uh, utilities, that kind of thing. Months after Jimenez's hiring, details about his record started to emerge. And according to Anzel Dua, so did information that city staff had failed to do any vetting of his criminal history whatsoever. Poteet City Secretary last week confirmed there is no background check in Jimenez's employment file. A second former council member who voted to hire Jimenez says the group was unaware he'd even been involved in a criminal case. Ansel Dua says the footage being made public could alter Jimenez's future in Poteet. With that out, that will change the dynamics, I think, in my opinion, because that those are some serious allegations. For the defenders, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. Jimenez did not respond to repeated requests for comment for this story. His contract, by the way, expires in early December in Poteet. The victim, his former girlfriend, declined to be interviewed, saying she's worked hard to put this ordeal behind her. All right, turning now to weather. Let's take a live look outside with live cam 90 degrees out there, Adam. The end of a very hot day. Yeah, you know, you know it's Ju it's July when at 10 p.m. we're reading 90 degrees yeah. at the airport in San Antonio, and we made it up to 102 over the weekend. We had our first 100 degree day, and guess what? We'll be back above 100 in just a few more days. No hazy dust in store anytime soon, at least within the next seven days, and even a slight chance of rain to talk about it. And we could really use that rain. Take a look at the graph of the aquifer since June 1st, and keep in mind, 660, the 10 day rolling average at or below, I should say below 660, is when we have stage one restrictions. Now our current level is 659.8 but the 10 day rolling average has to be below 660 in order to roll into the uh, stage one restrictions. But we fear we're not that far away from that. Unfortunately, uh, just take a look at the last 30 days in terms of percent of normal precipitation. If it's 100%, then you're at your average precip, but we're all below 100%. Some locations east of town and even up near Austin close to their 30 day normal. But here in San Antonio, we're only 44% of our 30 day normal precipitation and today hey we had a few showers pop up on the radar screen in parts of the hill country didn't amount to much but we had a few little radar echoes out there and the radar estimating just a few hundredths of an inch of rain here and there here's the radar from earlier today along with the satellite and you'll see there we go in the afternoon two three o'clock some very isolated and broken showers in the hill country now what the main feature we have driving this is this little indentation in the upper level flow this is actually a little trough a little disturbance and right now it's flaring up some showers around dallas dallas and wichita falls by the way some of the few locations in texas that are above normal for their 30 day precipitation. Anyway, this little disturbance that's going to hang around through the next couple of days and we're on the tail end of it, but it's just enough to bring some showers close to us to really keep those rain chances slight as they are, but to keep them in the forecast. Most of the rain will be North Texas and East Texas as a result of that disturbance. And then the upper level high really starts to settle in toward the end of the week. So let's take a look at our future cast. As we go through the night, maybe an isolated shower closer to the border or even in the hill country. Tomorrow morning, some low clouds, stray shower possible, a 10% chance. Then we get into tomorrow afternoon, and that's when it wouldn't surprise me if we saw some very widely separated and isolated showers popping up here and there on the radar screen. And the future cast may be overdoing it just a little bit, keep in mind. And there is that slight chance there with that disturbance still somewhat in our neck of the woods. We're giving it about a 20 to 30% chance tomorrow, the 20% chance on Wednesday, 
then we wipe away those rain chances, unfortunately. Now, this is nice without the thick African dust. You can actually see downtown this evening from our south side camp. We topped out at 98 today. That's four degrees above average, and we were in the triple digits in the usual locations closer to the Rio Grande and southwest of town. Right now, we're hovering around 90 across most of South Texas, but still well into the 90s out west. Del Rio, for example, at, for example, at 97. Carrizo Springs now at 95. And yep, we're feeling the mugginess, that's for sure. Dew point is 75 in Pleasanton, 74 in New Braunfels. It is sticky out there. Tomorrow morning, we'll start the day at 78, near 90 at noon, about 97, 98 for the high temperature. That 20% chance and briefly elevating it to a 30% chance for a few hours in the afternoon. Then we get into Wednesday, upper 90s again, 20% chance. And there we go. When it's nothing but sunshine, you know what happens. We're back above the century mark, probably 102, 103 even by the weekend. Wow. <laughs> Ouch. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we can. Wow. Thank we do it every God. year. Yes. We might as well, you know, do it this year. Indeed. That's right. All right. You get the sense that the Spurs know what's facing them on the court and off the court. Yeah. It's, it's not just, you know, playing in eight games or trying to make the right. playoffs. It's kind of surviving the bubble, if you will. And we'll talk to Rudy Gay about that when we come back <laughs> off a virtual press conference held today. And the record breaking contract that Patrick Mahomes just agreed to with the Super Bowl champs is bigger than we thought. Coming up. Our San Antonio Spurs continue their individual workouts before departing for Orlando, Florida in the NBA's environment bubble on Thursday. Rudy Gay, who's now 33 years old and about to turn 34 next month, admits it's been a challenge for him being one of the older players to stay in shape during the NBA hiatus. But he's up for the challenge of restarting the 2019-2020 season. That said, the number of coronavirus cases have skyrocketed in Florida. Now at over 200,000 coming off the July 4th weekend and recording their fourth straight day of 10,000 positive cases or more in that state, going from one COVID-19 hotspot in Texas to one in Florida. Is Rudy concerned about the players catching the coronavirus while the NBA bubble at Disney World? Whenever you get a group of people in one spot, you have to have that kind of thought. Each individual person has to do their part in, in creating a safe, safe space for us. And, and also, um, you know, just continue to be healthy and, and, and have, have healthy habits. I mean, it's inevitable. You get a bunch of different individuals in one spot. You, I mean, it's going to be hard to keep things out of out of there. You know, Rudy was also asked today during the Spurs virtual press conference. He had a chance to talk to his teammates about the message they want to send in the social justice movement. This is our platform. This is our chance to be able to, to do whatever it is that we plan on doing, whatever we talk about. But this is our chance. And, um, you know, we're going out here and trying not to be a distraction to that, but uplift uplift, you know, those positive, those positive people out there trying to create change. Nets general manager Sean Mark says he is consulting with both Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving about who will be their next head coach after the Nets fire Kenny Atkinson in March. Former Spurs player and assistant coach Jacques Vaughn has been named interim coach and is up for the permanent position. But a name being mentioned often is Greg Popovich, who knows Marks very well since he used to play and work in the front office of the Spurs before becoming the Nets general manager, the longest tenured coach in all of major sports. Pop is believed to have a year-to-year -year deal with the Silver and Black to keep him coaching, but at 71 years of age, may not feel it's the right time to pick up and move to work with a new team despite their potential. Pro Football Coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Patrick Mahomes has just agreed to his richest contract in sports history when he and the Kansas City Chiefs agreed to a 10-year contract extension worth over $450 million. So keep in with Casey until the year 2031. And the injury guarantee is $140 million. Previously, Mike Trout had the largest contract in professional sports at 12 years, $427 million. But when you combine the last two years of his rookie contract plus incentives, it's actually a total of over $503 million. That is exactly what Dak Prescott's people were hoping for to drive up his price. It appears the Washington Redskins are working on changing their nickname. The only question is, can it get done before the season kicks off? There are reports that say head coach Ron Rivera is meeting with principal owner Dan Snyder to consider some possible new nicknames, one of which could be the Generals, but they'd have to negotiate through the Harlem Globetrotters since that's the name of their long-suffering opponent. Nike's already announced it will not sell Washington gear online until the name is changed is complete. And now three 
three minority owners who own 40% of the team together have hired an investment banking firm to sell their shares, according to the Washington Post. Robert Rothman, Dwight Scar, and Frederick Smith are the owners who want out. Smith is the chairman of FedEx and owns the naming rights to Washington Stadium for $205 million and has demanded the name change. Bad news for the Alamo City. The Texas High School Coaches Association has now canceled their convention, originally scheduled for July 19th through the 21st at the Henry B. Gonzalez Convention Center. It's going to be the first major convention since the COVID-19 pandemic began, but unfortunately the coronavirus numbers are way up in Texas and Bear County, and they decided to make that convention virtual only. The president calls out Bubba Wallace and the Astros ready to return to camp next. The president of the United States, Donald Trump, is calling out NASCAR's Bubba Wallace, demanding an apology from Wallace of the discovery of a noose on a garage rope at Talladega. That's after the FBI determined that no hate crime occurred, saying their investigation showed the noose had been in that garage long before Wallace and his team were assigned that slot. And now the president in this tweet is calling it all a hoax. Has Bubba Wallace apologized to all those great NASCAR drivers and officials who came to his aid, stood by his side, and were willing to sacrifice everything for him, only to find out that the whole thing was just another hoax? That and flag decision caused low lowest ratings ever. The flag decision is in reference to the Confederate flag being banned by NASCAR. Bubba Wallace had a lengthy response to the president's tweet, but did not get that specific until towards the end where he wrote in part, always deal with the hate being thrown at you with love, love over hate every day. Love should come naturally as people are taught to hate, even when it's hate from POTUS. Love wins. The Houston Astros have their camp tomorrow after calling it off today after COVID-19 tests did not arrive until later today. Those tests were taken on Friday and due to the holiday weekend, the results were not made available until late this afternoon. The Astros did not say if any of their players actually tested positive, but I guess it's not much of an alarm since you're going to have the camp again starting tomorrow. Yeah, and they, I think they what they start on the 24th of July is when sure the first game do. does. Something sure like do. Yeah. Yep. All right. Thanks, Greg. Yeah. Hey, coming up next. Our live KSAT Q&A with Eric Epley, the man in charge of trying to keep track of how many hospital beds we have in Bear County and in the South Texas region. We'll talk to him coming up. It's our KSAT Q&A where we separate the fact from the fiction that's out there. We go to experts to go right to the source for what is happening in the community. And we're talking about largely hospital beds and the hospitalization rates right now. Eric Epley is the executive director of the Southwest Texas Regional Advisory Council. Joining us, staying up late with us. We appreciate that, Eric. And first off, explain, I'm gonna call it STRAC from now on. So explain what STRAC is. Sure, well, STRAC is the Regional Trauma and Emergency Healthcare System for uh, 22 counties in and around San Antonio. Uh, it's a big area, about 26,000 square miles, uh, bigger than the state of West Virginia for a region that's a pretty good size. Uh, goes out to Del Rio, down to Eagle Pass, back around to maybe Gonzales, back up to Gonzales, I mean, back to Guadalupe County, then up to New Braunfels, out to Fredericksburg, and then on back out the hill country to um, uh, to Del Rio, if that gives you a size of the, the size of the map. Yeah, and right now I'm, I'm guessing most of what you're talking about, if not all of what you're talking about, is COVID-19. It, it's... COVID-19 24-7, 365 right now. We heard during the briefing today that there was 12% of available beds. Can you talk to us about how hospitalization rates are calculated? Yeah, so uh, you, you have total people. Um, well, first of all, let me talk about um, percentage of people who are positive in the hospital. So if you have total number of the numerator denominator process, pretty easy. Um, if you have, you know, 3,500 people total in there and 1,100 or 1,200 are positive, that gives you that percentage. Um, with respect to the 12%, um, you know, our, our, we calculate numbers every single day starting about 7.30 or 8. By 9.30 or so, that first report comes out. And uh, um, we go through that with the uh, chief medical officers from each of the healthcare systems and, and review that data. And, and when we're talking about available hospital beds, we're not talking about just available hospital beds for COVID-19 patients. That's right. That's right. So 12% of those beds in town are now um, available. And, and by the way, to allay any fears, uh, you know, that, that's a tight number. But remember that that's expandable. We're, we're continuing to expand into other units. And, and the more staff we get, uh, we're turning on more beds. Right now, we're not bed limited, we're staff limited. And if, uh, to try to explain, you've probably been to a hotel at some times when there was a whole floor that wasn't on. 
And so uh, until you have the ability to put nurses around that area, that's, that's when you can expand into that area. So right now with our total available staff beds, we just need more nurses. For so long, San Antonio had watched as other cities and other communities across the nation were going through their surges. And now here we are going through our, our own surge. Is San Antonio prepared for the surge at this point? Uh, I, I think we're as prepared as we can be. I, I think we're working every single day, every single healthcare system, every EMS agency is working hard to be as prepared as we can be. Um, I'm always nervous to say, are we completely prepared? I think that's a journey. It's not a, there's not an end point. And uh, as the situation changes every day, it feels like we have new challenges to try to solve for. It seemed like that uh, in listening to the county judge and the mayor today, they were talking about a slowdown in the acceleration of positive cases and that there were some things that they were seeing that they said they were cautiously optimistic about. I. I know you, you, a lot of what you do is game out worst case scenarios. So do you share that cautious optimism or are you still in, hey, let's don't get ahead of ourselves here? I'm in, let's not get ahead of ourselves just yet. We've had a couple of good days of numbers and uh, I certainly would, would love to look at those numbers and say things are turning to the better, but I'm, I, my friends sometimes call me Debbie Downer because I'm, I'm going to look at the worst part of the scenario so that if things do go uh, worse, that we're prepared for that. Although we have had some decreases in our, our positive rate um, of patients per day in the hospital um, that is slightly down. It, it's still going up. It's not like it's, it's you know, what, what we're saying is, you know, it's not going up at 80 or 100 per day now. It's only going up at 15 or 20 or 25 or 30 a day. Well, that's still going up. So we fill up not in a week or in 10 days, but in 15 days or 20 days or 30. See what I'm saying? So it's, it, I'll start breathing when uh, the numbers start going down each day instead of going up. You know, for the public, for the everyday person, I think there's a balance between seeking medical attention if you really need it, and then also not wanting to contribute to the overwhelming of the system. How, what advice do you have for the public when it comes to assessing whether or not you really need to go to the hospital? Well, number one, I will tell you, our hospitals are prepared to take care of anybody right now at any time. If you're having a medical emergency, you should go to the hospital no matter what. And uh, if you're having COVID uh, problems at home and you're dealing with that at home, if you're having things like shortness of breath where you can't catch your breath, those are, those are serious circumstances and you should go to the hospital. Um, your, your, your primary care doctor, if you don't feel like it's an emergency, that's somebody to reach out to and talk to, or there are other resources available as well. The Metro Health has a hotline, for instance. But anyone who feels like they're having a medical emergency should go to the hospital no matter what. We've got room for those people. Eric, I want to give you the final say tonight. What do you, what's one thing you want our viewers to take out of this interview? I, I think we're, for the first time, maybe these numbers, if I were to say something, it's like masks are important. Wear your mask every time, no matter what. Wash your hands before every meal. Wash them 10 times a day. And keep your social distancing, and we'll, we'll get through this together. This is solvable, but we have to have diligence and we have to have consistency. And uh, if people will help us with that, we'll help the first responders and we'll help our vulnerable populations. And perhaps nobody knows that this crisis is real more than you do. Uh, there's a bunch of people. It's not just me. There's a lot of people uh, in, this, in this fight right now. So we appreciate all the support we can get. All right. Eric Epley with Strack. Appreciate your time tonight staying up late with us. Thank you. No problem. See you guys. All right. Thank take you. care. We'll be right back. It is a breaking news story we've been following on the east side tonight. We are now learning a shooting in the 1800 block of Rogers Avenue has turned deadly. That's in the Government Hill neighborhood near I-35 in New Braunfels. The night team Tiffany Huertas is there where police just provided an update. Tiffany, what are you learning? Steve Eces, we're learning that a 35 year old man was shot and died here at the scene. Take a look. This is an active scene. We're at the corner of Rogers Avenue and Mason Street. SAPD says they arrived here after they received a call about shots fired. Police say this involves a family disturbance that escalated to a shooting. A 35 year old man was shot and died at the scene. Police say he was shot in the upper torso. Now, 
Police say there was a suspect that was taken into custody and a weapon was recovered. Now, this is an ongoing investigation. Stay with us online on ksat.com for the latest. Steve Isis. Thank you, Tiffany. Police are also looking for a suspect in a shooting from the west side. This is near Fredericksburg and Almost Drive. It happened at a property in the 2100 block of Sacramento. Police say someone went to the area to buy a gun from the suspect. Officers say the suspect then shot the driver three times before taking off in a maroon truck. Well, there are now nearly 3 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 here in the U.S., and more than 130,000 people have died. Health experts especially concerned after many were seen across the country not practicing social distancing over the weekend. ABC's Rena Roy has the latest. Massive crowds of people on Fire Island off the shore of Long Island, New York, over the holiday weekend. Similar scenes at beaches and bars across the country as 38 states see a surge in cases, including Florida, where new cases have doubled in just two weeks. The state making up 20 percent of all daily cases in the country. The age that has the most cases in the state of Florida uh, is age 21. Just because you're 21, um, and you may not uh, have significant symptoms. That does not mean that you can't infect other people. Miami-Dade now reversing course on reopening plans, once again shutting down gyms and restaurants. California Governor Gavin Newsom also ordering bars and indoor dining closed in San Diego and five other counties, L.A. County hitting a record high number of cases over the weekend. Cases are surging, hospitalizations are increasing, and mostly, this is all a reflection of a lot more community spread. Texas, another hotspot with more than 200,000 cases. Arizona, one of eight states topping 100,000. We see young people coming into the hospitals and saying nobody told them that they would get sick. We've seen young people sick, get sick, and we've seen young people even die. President Trump facing backlash, again downplaying the virus, the claiming the surge the is a result of more testing. But now we have tested almost 40 million people. By so doing, we show cases, 99% of which are totally harmless. Health experts refuting that claim. Dr. Anthony Fauci saying the steady climb is partly because some areas reopened too quickly. The current state is really not good. President Trump is expected to hold another campaign rally on Saturday in New Hampshire. It will be outdoors and masks will be provided but not required like his other rallies during the pandemic where many were seen without face coverings. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. When the pandemic hit in mid-March, two grand juries continued working in spite of the danger. Paul Venema outlines a proposal from the local administrative judge that would give the jurors what he calls hazard pay for their service. Though the numbers at the outset of the pandemic were nowhere near today's positive tests and deaths, two grand juries not only remained at work, but agreed to serve an additional two months. We didn't know where we were headed. We had no idea how contagious this virus was. The central jury room was shut down and a moratorium on jury service was ordered by local administrative judge Ron Runhill. It was a scary time and these individuals actually said, regardless of the, of the unknown forces that may await us in the courthouse, we're willing to come in and put aside our own personal safety to make sure that justice is done. And that, Ron Hell said he'll tell county commissioners, is worth more than the $40 a day that grand jurors are paid. What the judges would like to do is pay them for an additional day per week for the time that they were here, extra, the time that they went above and beyond what they initially signed on for. Total cost, $14,720. How do they figure into the big picture at the courthouse in certain terms of what they're doing? It's intangible. The things, that, the things that they do are hard to quantify, but it is very significant as it relates to our justice system and as it relates to public safety. All Venema, KSAT 12 News. I'll take a live look outside with live cam tonight. It was a very 4th of July week-like <laughs> yes, weekend. Yes, it was. It felt like it's the 4th of July. You know, I feel like I can tell you in December and January what the 4th of July is going to be like exactly. here in San Antonio with pretty high degree of confidence. And we did make it 
at and even above 100 through the weekend on Sunday. That was our high point. We made it to 102. So, so far, two 100 degree days this year. Today we made it up to 98. That's four degrees above average for the high temperature. The real heat was especially south and west of town. As usual, 106 Catula and Carrizo Springs. Del Rio topped out at 105. All right, let's take a look at our drought monitor. I talked about the aquifer earlier, how the aquifer level is now below 660. The 10 day average is 660.8. Once that 10 day average drops below 660, that's when stage one restrictions are triggered. And I don't think we're very far away from that. The drought monitor has shown growing drought and dryness over the past couple of weeks and most of that right now west of town, but we could all use a good splash of rain and good splash of water. And today we had a few little showers pop up in the hill country and I even saw a couple of them in northeastern Gonzales County earlier this afternoon. Very, very brief in nature. They didn't amount to anything agriculturally insignificant, but there is this little dip in the upper level flow near Dallas. Notice the more robust rain showers, Dallas, Oklahoma, parts of East Texas throughout the day today, even stretching into Louisiana and Arkansas. That's where most of the energy is. We're just far enough to remove to where we don't have a good real widespread rain chance, but we're close enough to where a few isolated pop up showers are in the works for the next couple of days. Highly isolated in nature, though. We'll go through time tonight. Can't rule out an isolated shower. Don't count on it. Same thing with tomorrow morning. Then we get into the afternoon and we'll see about a 20 to 30% chance. There you go by 5 PM. This particular model showing some widely separated showers popping up on the radar. It may be overdoing it just a little bit, but what it does is it illustrates that possibility. We're close enough to that upper disturbance to at least have a chance at a few showers before we crank up the heat more. You can see the rain cooled air. Dallas at 77, Abilene now down to 77. Meanwhile, we're 87 in San Antonio, 97 right now in Del Rio. So still warm out there and look, look what happens. We're back up and above 100. I mean, we're talking 100 to 103 by the upcoming weekend. So tomorrow we'll start the day at 78 by the noon hour right near 90. About 97 for the high mixture of sun and clouds and that 20 to 30% chance, especially in the afternoon. Still a 20% chance of a few stray showers on Wednesday. Then it's nothing but sunshine with that heat Thursday through the weekend. Find a pool. Didn't you kind of miss the 4th of July though when you know out at the <laughs> park or maybe some hot dogs, True. hamburgers? Fireworks, everybody fireworks, with yeah. rosy red cheeks yeah, and the, sweating together. The human claw, you know. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> well, summer travel is seeing a transformation amid this pandemic. The new top destination many are researching for their next trip. And for those looking to rent a private home for their vacation, you may want to consider a few tips beforehand. The steps you should be aware of before you book. Next on the Night Beat. Summer travel taking a hit amid this pandemic. AAA predicting travel will fall more than 14.5% between July and September compared to last year. The organization expecting more than 700 million trips overall in that time period. And traveling by car will likely account for 97% of all the trips this summer. Air travel forecasted to be 74% below last year's levels. AAA says when it comes to percent uh, to recent online searches for trip destinations, some cities aren't as popular right now. For example, Orlando, Florida dropped from the top top search city destination to number eight. Denver, Colorado made the biggest climb from number 10 all the way to number one. Oh, with summer vacations rapidly changing, people who are leery of shared spaces and crowds are renting private vacation homes instead. 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz says there are still important precautions you should take. Sensing that her family badly needed a break, Nancy Vargas logged on to Airbnb and rented a home with a pool. A big reason why we went with an Airbnb home versus staying at a hotel was that it was just going to be us in this immediate area, and we felt that we were protecting ourselves um, during this time. The best way to minimize your risk is to stay home. But if you are planning to rent a vacation home this summer, there are some steps you can take to try to protect yourself and others. 
If you're traveling from a place with a high rate of COVID-19, you should quarantine yourself for at least two weeks before you go or after you arrive. If you're leaving town or the state, check local rules about quarantining. Check the refund policy before you book, particularly regarding the terms if there's a COVID-19 outbreak in the area or new travel restrictions are put in place. Ideally, the property should already be disinfected prior to your arrival. To be extra vigilant, you can wipe down the high touch surfaces like faucets and fridge. If if you are sick, don't travel. If someone gets sick while you're away. If someone in the house has a fever or respiratory symptoms, they should be kept isolated in a separate room. You can call your doctor for advice and notify the local health department as well as the host. Even though the Vargas is kept to themselves, they plan to stay home for two weeks when they return. For us, I wouldn't change a day. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. He was born on July 7, 1940 in Liverpool, England. Tomorrow, Ringo Starr, the iconic Beatles drummer, will turn 80 years old. His given name is actually Richard Starkey Jr. The name Ringo came from his habit of wearing numerous rings. Since 2008, he's celebrated his birthday by encouraging people to take a moment for peace and love. This year, he plans to host a show that will benefit the Black Lives Matter Global Network, among other organizations. The special streams tomorrow on Star's YouTube channel. Happy birthday, Ringo. Yeah, yeah. Richard Starkey, I like Ringo. <laughs> so that's a good ring to it. The upper 70s in the morning tomorrow by the afternoon will be well into the 90s and even just over 100 farther south and west of San Antonio. Thank you, Adam. That's it for the night beat. Don't forget, good morning, San Antonio at 4.30. Good night.